Kia ora and welcome to Sobriety Chat. I am your host, Lotta Dan, otherwise known as Mrs. D. I am the community manager and content creator here at Living Sober. And today, this is a treat. I am joined by Di Henwood. Now, Di, if those of you who don't know, he is an award-winning comedian. He's an actor. He's a TV host and presenter. He's a husband. He's a father. And he is sober. Welcome, Di. Yes. Oh, thanks so much. Kia ora all. Um, no, thanks so much for having me on. I was just, when you invited me, I was sort of looking at, at how long I'd been sober for and um, it, was, it was quite refreshing actually having to look that up because for so, for so long I went through every day sort of counting the length and I've been almost two and a half years now. So um, it's been it's been a journey not without struggle at all, but with a lot of struggle, but um, so rewarding and and so lovely to chat here. So why did you quit drinking, Di? What was happening? Well, sort of a brief, in a nutshell, when I um, was young, I used to this sort of precursor to alcohol. I used to go to Japan quite a lot with my dad. He um, he toured Phantom of the Opera around Japan, and one of the um, one of the actors in the show would have, was a, a Buddhist monk. And she taught me how to do meditation, and I just loved meditation. And that wow. was became, and I went to a um, monastery and learned proper sort of seated zazen meditation and all this. And then it, that completely fell by the wayside. I became a comedian. I traveled the world drinking and having a good and a bad time in equal measures. Um, We'd and be silly to deny the good times. I mean, oh yeah, true. I yeah. I had great times. I created some great content when I was drinking, but drinking went from fun to it started becoming an issue for me, um, quite a serious issue. And um, I I met my partner, who is now my wife, in sort of two thousand and six, and we drank a lot together. But then I started drinking too much, and um, I was a I was a good drunk. I um, in terms of the fact that um, I wasn't abusive, violent, I didn't rip into people and all that carry on. Not which a lot of probably, drama. Yeah, which probably served others good, but not myself because it meant my point of needing to stop probably got pushed out a bit. However, I caused my wife a lot of pain. Um, through my drinking, um, through worry, through stress, through going away on tours and coming back and she knew I'd still be half-sozzled because I caught an early flight and I was still half-sozzled or I'd had a, a couple of beers at the Corrie Lounge before I got on the plane. And um, she she had voiced that to me a few times and I'd said, no, nah, I don't have a drinking problem. This is who I am. I'm known as the pissed comedian guy. And um, but then it started to get through. She sort of she stuck by me. She was an amazing support network. And then this was early, early days for me was trying to find communities like you like living sober is such an awesome community. The the only one that was sort of around at this time was Hello Sunday Morning. Um, yeah which Chris Rain, I believe his name is. I got in touch with him. I sort of um, really launched into that. The idea behind that was sort of more short-term things, take three months off, re-associate with alcohol. So I started getting into this pattern of take three months off, reset, I'll come back all guns blazing as this guy who can just have a beer and all that. Moderate. <laughs> Moderate. Then that would that sure sure I'd moderate for two weeks, and then by the time a month had gone by, I'm back at square one. But this time it has so much added anxiety and pressure on me because one I've admitted to myself internally I have a drinking problem. So not only am I just being loose and drinking, I am realizing that I need to stop. And so then I do another three months. Then then I get I 
get to a lot better place with drinking. Um, I was not a spirits person. I was a beer guy, so and I would hold off and so forth. And I had kids and got married. So things just naturally tampered down because I wasn't going out all night. I wasn't partying like I was. But I'd still have couch parties where I'd drink. Often, often I would be, the next day, I would be anxious. And it wouldn't be after a particularly big session, but it would be I would drink more than I had planned to drink. So I'd let myself down. I still had drunk enough to have a hangover. Um, it's that internal I, angst, isn't oh, it? That internal dialogue, that knowing the, it's a problem and yet doing it, and it's confusing, it's debilitating, it's you're disappointing yourself, you've got no one else to blame. It's a very difficult place to be in. Oh, it is. And don't, no one should think it is easy or like just, oh, you should have just not drunk. But But so much... In those early days, so much is about breaking a habit as well. I'm, I, I must say I'm talking from a point of someone who was not medically addicted to alcohol in terms of the fact that I could stop without causing myself, um, without yeah. causing too much stress to the body. So, of course, um, I have known people and friends who – just stopping would be a bad idea. They need but, to have a managed but, withdrawal, yeah. Yeah, and be yeah so you yeah. you really do need to, to work with health professionals and so forth. But once I'd sort of admitted it to myself and then, it, honestly, it became the best part of 10 years getting fully sober for me. Right. Um, and then I just got to this crossroads where um, there's a quote which I'll paraphrase, which is that thing of when I'm enjoying it, I'm not controlling it. And when I'm controlling it, I'm not enjoying it. And that's where I was with yes. alcohol. So I was never getting, if I was going out and I was, okay, I'm going to drink tonight, but I'm not getting pissed. So I'm having three beers. Then I'm just controlling it and I'm looking at the time and I'm going, right, I'm pacing my beers. And then those nights when I'd go stuff it, then I'd just go loose and then I'd get that huge anxiety. Regret and anxiety. So what was holding you back for 10 years from making that final, I'm not going to have it anymore? Was it a fear of like a life without alcohol? Was it this kind of hope that you could be a moderate drinker? Was it pressure it, from the outside? Was it all of the above? <laughs> it was all of the above, really, because I, I enjoyed drinking because I hadn't had a long enough stint not enjoying realising I was the same person without it. I was having worries that I wouldn't be as funny on stage. Being a, a comic who works live, it's one of the few jobs where you show up and people give you a beer before work. So um, that was always quite weird. All of my friends are big drinkers, um, some can handle it, some can't handle it. And as I've gotten to my 40s, I now realise that everyone either has an issue with booze or knows someone who has an issue with booze. Like, it's oh, yeah. so pervasive. Mm. Um, and then I, it finally clicked for me. It was 2019. My father had passed away. I'd... Um, I just when I was determined to, I wanted to just go to do his funeral, his wake, sober and just respect him, even though he was a big drinking Welshman, um, just to respect that. And I was so proud I did um, because I really remember his send off so fondly mm. and I have zero regrets. And I knew I turned up and showed up as the son he loved. Um, so I was responsible and could give him a wonderful send off and sort of facilitate that and be there for my mother because I was a, I'm an only child. Mm. Um, and but then I went to Japan again. It was I was working at the Rugby World Cup, and I just the first night I got there, we it was all excitement. We end up at a sort of small six sixty concert. 
I'm all, oh, start having some beers. Oh, these taste good. Then all of a sudden uh, I wake up in my hotel room with a massive hangover. And that actually sparked me into trying to make the decision. I, I'm a hugely spiritual person on a sort of um, leaning more towards Eastern philosophies in terms of the fact that I don't believe in a God, but so much as I, but I do believe there is some sort of creator of energy in the universe. And I sort of, I suppose I love the universe <laughs> and I, yes. all the, all the teachings around um, Taoism and Buddhism and that I, mm. I feel really resonate, especially with people who are getting sober because um, it, it, they're, they're a great way of awakening your soul. Yeah. And so I went, look, I keep doing this meditation, but then boozing, and then boozing stops me meditating. So what am I? I'm either a, I've got to just pick up and shut up. Am I someone who's going to go down a spiritual path and look after myself and my health and be there for my family, or am I just going to say stuff it? I, I'm a dude who drinks. I drink. And I chose that that other path. And then over the following month or two, I sort of had a beer here or there. Then I was on the seven days tour and I was in, I would finished a show and I just had a beer and I just went, this is it, done now. Really? Done. So it was quite quiet at the end. And yeah, like it wasn't a give up after a big, after it was a big, big build up, years of building up and having an internal dialogue and trying different things but the actual last moment was just a nice quiet yeah. moment where you went this is it <laughs> it was that that was also reading my journals because uh, I journal as much as I can and I read my journals and I was like god these are boring they're just a dude <laughs> they're just a dude talking about giving up booze <laughs> just give right. up the booze man right. you know because so many entries were oh, I drank more than I wanted last night you know, this is yeah. the, you know, oh, yeah. my, my wife and I had a lovely dinner, but then we had a bit of stupid niggle in the taxi coming home because we'd had too many drinks. And so my wife is six months ahead of me on getting sober. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. So she, um, she, she had her own battles with drink, and um, and I think she realised. Uh, and I now fully realise it was so much better for our relationship. And now, I mean, I'm... And I then in 2020, I got diagnosed with some really serious health stuff, which is still ongoing, which I um, don't really want to publicly go into yet. But um, I couldn't have dealt with any of that mm. with alcohol, and I actually think I probably might not be here if I'd been wow. drinking at the time, um, just because... I would have been, hey, it's all have a few beers. It's all okay. Don't worry about that health shit. That'll work itself out. You know, yeah. the next day, bawling your eyes out and, oh, woe is me. You know, so it gave me this even temperament and it, um, and it sort of just raised my base level of health to deal with some pretty heavy stuff. So um, it then just started a snowball the early days so hard so hard so day to day reading every and, but book like I... part of that right is is the fact as you put so well this culture we live in where it really is everywhere and especially when you're in the performing arts touring being in heightened kind of environments with extroverted people and alcohol goes hand in hand with that and you said there was a fear you know would I be funny that how has that played out? How how have you found that the sober die is able to still do all of this sort of outward facing work? Well, I'm way better at it, to be honest. Like now, my material's a lot better. I can develop a show faster because I'll perform. And when I'm working up material, when you're doing open mic nights and you're working up um, bits, I'll do it. Then instead of drinking at the bar, I'll go home and work on it and I'll record it and listen to it. And so I'm actually better and I'm more productive with it. And the hardest thing, to be honest, is managing the adrenaline after a show. 
because you're kind of wired. Yeah, because and this is where booze being a depressant played its part. Was yeah, it would I find wind that as well. Down. Yeah, I find that as well. That's what actually I've never actually really thought about this or talked about it much. But when I do something heightened, like a performance thing or a, it, I'm really heightened for quite a while. And it, if especially if it's late at night, I cannot sleep. <laughs> oh yeah, I've been doing a few things with with British in the British yes. time zone. So I'll finish it at, at eleven or something, and then just wired. Mm, I've never so thought was, about that. So that was then, like, I then lent deeply into meditation, reading stuff, trying to figure out happiness. And once I realized that sort of adage that happiness isn't the absence of problems, happiness is your ability to deal with those problems, um, that just filled me with power because I was going, I'm actually always going to have issues. Yeah. Like, um, there's always going to be a problem of, yeah, you know, everything's falling life. down. So I'm, <laughs> your life. I'm meant to be there, but oh shit, I've got to pick my kid up because they're sick at school. And there's always going to be stuff. So it's my ability to just deal with them, and mm. um, I suppose learning a bit more about consciousness and how it interacts with your body and all this sort of thing. Mm. And one thing I, I'll tell you, I found really hard when I was giving up, and um. This is one of the few times in history it might be hard to be a, a 40 year old white guy. Um, <laughs> is that all the communities around getting sober, not, not all of them, and it's changed a lot now, but I'm talking when I was sort of getting trying to get sober over the last 10 years, very much lean towards a yoga female bent and the ones it was like whenever I sort of got into a, a group or so forth, it, there wasn't a, a lot of masculinity around getting sober. And so, you're talking I about did, online or in real life? Or oh, online. Um, I didn't do much. Uh, and this is just not me judging at all because I didn't do a lot of research and I sort of found a few touch points. I talked to a wonderful guy, James Nakisa, who's um, you've probably come across in your travels. No. And Oh, he's a he's a Wellington comedian. Um, oh, hang on, I think I might know, yeah. And um, sort of uh, luckily there was support um, and sort of there is a, a lot of comics who, who are getting sober and I sort so of... So you're talking about the need to connect with people that you can relate to and that for whatever reason, I mean, well, obvious reasons, but it's not putting the, the yoga women down, but it's just that's not your, that's not you. <laughs> no, but weirdly, it is me. I am a late 30s yoga mum in Lulamon leggings. <laughs> yeah. And if you take the beard off, like, because I am, I'm so into, like, yoga and I do a thing called Qigong, which is sort of like a healing version of Tai Chi. And I, like, I, lo I loved it, but it also, I just could have, I, I suppose I just struggled to find a community that clicked with yeah. me. Um, have you got that now? Yeah, I do. I do through just... um meeting more people who don't drink nowadays. I know. It's funny how like, it, ta it takes time though, right? And we talk about this on the site often because people, you know, sometimes there's an adjustment and that people are often worried about losing their friends, especially if they're in a big boozy gang. And that's one of the things that can be a barrier to quitting is I don't want to lose my friends. And But yet they're in this dark place. And so we always say to them, look, just hold on because lovely authentic deep relationships will come but it takes time for them to develop you can't fast track it so just try and concentrate on what you're doing for yourself grieve if you're losing friends or maybe those friendships will reshape but also trust that new people are going to come in that you're going to find and connect with that you wouldn't have when you were still drinking oh it's so so true it's the um it's like not trying to push anything as the as the, as Buddhists would say, like the, the teacher comes along when you are ready, mm. like the, the friend will come along. I found, I just found, I didn't lose friends. I just didn't see them. 
and the ones who really mattered I did see. So it was just like, yeah, sure, these people who I'd then bump into, I'd still go, hey, and we'd have a good time chatting, but it would be a quick chat on the street. Yeah, yeah. My sort of core group of mates, I still catch up with. They still drink. And actually, now I've given up, I realise how little they drink. Yeah, I know. Isn't that amazing? (laughs) I always (laughs) thought they drank the same amount as me, but I was like, oh, no, you actually have a couple of beers and then just stop drinking. Yeah. So that was a great eye-opener. And then the thing is, for that early stage, going out is really hard. So hard. Oh, my God. You feel like you've got a big neon sign flashing over your head, sober, you know, and everyone's staring at you, I remember. Um, New Zealand is like every single thing, basically from 11 in the morning afterwards, is assumed that you'd have a drink at a beer or a wine. And then the other the thing I found is also – People who serve beer and wine have this huge assumption everyone drinks orange juice. Oh, I haven't God. drunk orange juice since I was oh. at school. It's actually <laughs> getting better, Di, because, I mean, I've oh, been 10 it, years, it, 10 years now since I've had a drink. And when I first got sober, any function I went to, the only non-alcoholic offering would be <laughs> thick, cloying yeah. orange juice. Like, who wants to drink that all night at a wedding? Nowadays, you'll more often find some elderflower or something that's a bit more palatable. But did you, I just wanted to ask you, did you, do you, or did you get any shit from people for not drinking? Has anyone kind of said, oh, mate, what are you, fucking wells? You know, yeah, a lot. After and how the, do you deal with that? I never, the, the good thing is I never really got it from friends. I got a little bit in the get-go, but then my true friends had actually seen how long I'd struggled to give up alcohol so they really respected it and this comes back to the fact that you realize who your true yeah. friends are but being so we'd go on tour and there'd always be an expectation or an arrangement with a sponsor or so forth where you'd go out afterwards so you'd have to go to their venue for an hour or so forth and oh. it was like it was always the people that I would never have a drink with wanted to will give me shit for it who come up have a shot and i'm like nah man they're oh you know and then ripping you know don't call you every name under the sun it's like well i didn't want to have a shot with you even if i was drinking but in the past i would have had a shot with them to put up with them and then i would have had four more and then my tolerance for dickheads suddenly is really high instead i'd just push through that I'd go and talk to a couple of mates I'd be touring with or a soundy or something, and then I'd bugger off. And I'd go back and do do some meditation sort of for a wind down and just not having, for me it was I had too many spikes and too many troughs. Yeah. Uh, and life is a bit more boring, but I like the word boring. I like yeah. things being, I mean, Jeepers in a world that is drastically unpredictable uh, on every front at the moment. Having a bit of normal is good. And, yeah. like, I really, really feel for anyone and I have so much support for anyone who is taking the leap into sobriety now because there are so many triggers out there um, just with the news, with COVID, with war yeah. so many triggers to make you go stuff it and grab a drink but it will pay off it it does it pay does off. hang you in there that's what reg- we're always saying so yeah, do you, you ever... never regret not drinking so that's so true you never <laughs> wake up going god i wish i'd had a drink last night yeah do you ever have cravings anymore or do you ever have days where you're like she i wish i could escape or is it or is it yes. easier now? It's what's weird is every time I think it's an event I'll have a craving at, like I'll go to a friend's fortieth or something, I suddenly will leave and go, Oh, that wasn't that was easy. 
you know, I stayed longer than I thought I was going to stay. I didn't feel like having a beer. But then, like, it was last year, last year I probably had my biggest cravings. I, I have a lot of little passing ones. Yeah. Like, I'll put a barbecue on and be, oh, I'd love a beer. But then, and you can kind of bat that away pretty quick. Yeah, and that, 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 that'll just pass through. But then last year I was, my son and I were doing a road trip down to Wellington and I got to, we were staying at Wairaki Resort just outside of Taupo there. And um, I just had, when I'd love a few beers. And then I was just like, no. And then we got into the room and it was awesome because the room didn't have a mini bar. So there wasn't that, the barrier to, the barrier to a craving had been raised. And then I was driving, and I, when we're, we're driving to a pool, and I was, I was wondering if there's a liquor store around here, I might get a beer. And then I was in that internal thing of, what are you doing, man? It's been like two, by the, this time it would have been almost two years. What was that like, about, do you think? Was it, so you were on a road trip with your son, was it? After yeah, so your dad there was died, nothing. Was it? Was it? What was going on for you emotionally? Like for me, if ever I'm really feeling like that, I can usually, I can usually, if I go deeper, I'll you, I'll find that there's something quite big that I'm feeling. I, th- I think it was. It was the first time that I'd felt like I was on holiday since all this COVID right. stuff had started because we'd left so Auckland for the first time. It built yeah, up and, and all the. And I sort of just, it lasted from pretty much midday to when I went to bed. And I just went, you know, pushed through. And my my thing is always, don't, if you're in a craving like that, I can't phrase it like, look, I, I never drink, so I can't have that drink. I just phrase it to, look, okay, let's so, let's look at this tomorrow. Yeah, and, ass- nice. and, assess- and assess the craving then. Okay, nice. let's just hold it off. You've got this far. Yep. Okay, there's the option of having a beer tomorrow. Yeah. And there'll be the option of having it the day after, but I let's just that. get through today. Yes. And then, of course, I woke up in the morning and it was just, wow, that was really weird yesterday. And then mm. it had gone. Oh, oh wonderful. But and did it, you have a great holiday? Yeah, had a great holiday. And then, of course, that. And I, during the, the afternoon where I had the cravings, I sort of did use tools out of the sort of sober toolbox of playing playing it forward and like going, okay, so I'm going to wake up early in the morning. My son's going to want to go for a swim straight away because this has got a really cool pool. Yeah. How am I going to feel? I'm going to be hungover in a thermal pool. That's going to feel <laughs> appalling. Yeah. So it was doing Not all that. Not to mention the it. guilt and the anxiety and the, all of it. I mean, that's the thing. Playing it forward is such a good tool. We talk about that quite a lot on this site because that twinkly promise of that first drink is so often not the reality, for, especially for those of us who were in that dark place with it. I just know where it would take me pretty quickly. But, hey, I yeah, just cause... wanted to, um, before we sort of wrap up, I just – you know, we, we know that there's still a lot of shame and stigma around crazily admitting that you get addicted to this addictive drug. Uh, and you're a you're a guy with a public profile. I mean, and most Kiwis would know who you are. How much of a big decision was it for you to be so open about your reality? It was quite a lot because I um, where the area I work in, I've always been associated back in the day when I sort of first got on TV and my live stuff of being a boozy comic and sort of being in that more hectic environment and um, even so forth, I, I, I work for Radio Hodaki and the ACC where we're doing a lot of stuff that is, they have a lot of alcohol sponsors and so forth, but there are, there's a couple of us who don't drink and proudly don't drink and it was hard, but then it was coming back to the fact of going, there's one universe and it's your universe. So what? you're the only one who sees the world and I'm the only one who sees my universe. So I may as well enjoy it. I can, the only thing, I can't control what happens to me, but I can control whether I suffer from it. So I was like, stuff it. I 
chose not to drink. I'm going to own this. It's not my job to stop people drinking, but I feel it is my job to support anyone who is struggling or just wanting to chat. And I've often have DMs on Twitter or Instagram with people who would see, like I did a chatted about it on the project and then a few people messaged and they were just young guys who yeah. were like 19, 20, who were like, hey, man, it was really cool seeing someone oh. who I respect talk about it. Oh, I'm struggling. Yeah. I'm in Dunedin, and a uni. Yeah, right. You know, I which mean, is like horrendous, yeah. let alone trying to get to grips with your own masculinity and who you are and all this sort of carry on. Oh, no, having your voice added to this space, I mean, I have been overjoyed and delighted for what it's worth because – because you are a cool guy. I mean, you are a comedian. You're a TV host, you know, and you're a dude. And you're younger. I mean, I'm a middle-aged housewife. I mean, you know, <laughs> no disrespect to me, but I am 50-year-old suburban mum. And so having someone like you, and I've, I've seen your tweet. I mean, I follow you on Twitter. And sometimes you'll just write a tweet, which is, what did you write? I tried to go back and look before we did this, but Twitter wouldn't let me. And you'd written something that really normalised emotional robustness you just said something like if it's really that hard is alcohol going to help or something and I'm just like this is a gift because having those conversations this this is the real shit man (laughs) like this is the truth of it this is our life this is our one life and so many people are boozing and numbing and not just doing the seems simple thing of just facing up to and feeling feeling what we feel and And also having your voice is just Oh, thank you. I I wanted to say that uh, to people who are giving up, the cards are stacked against you a bit. Like if people, if there's so many conspiracy theories going on in the world at the moment, but one that is actually true is alcohol lobbies. And New Zealand has a huge alcohol lobby and they don't want you to stop drinking. So they're going to make billboards that look, when once, I mean, a lot of people listening to this will be early sober, so they will realise when you're driving around, shit, they're everywhere. And they want you to keep drinking and they don't want... It's a rebellion. It is a it punk is rock thing to do is to not is. drink because you're just lining the pockets of big companies and that's poisoning you and it dulls down society and it it dulls down you. And I honestly believe that no matter where you are in your journey and how hard it is at the moment, that you're just a seed at the moment that can flower into something awesome. And everyone I know who has given up booze and once they have really worked their way through that early stage, they breathe out. I feel so much lighter. The fact that it has just melted away an attention in my relationship with my wife. We love each other more than anything, but there was always this tension that wasn't us. It was bloody alcohol. Mm, mm, And mm. so kick that to the curb. We communicate better. It's just... And as I said, I've actually, ironically, I've had it harder physically since I've given up booze, but I'm happier and I feel healthier than I ever have in my life. So do it. Keep going. (laughs) Well, what a note to end on. Die Henwood, you are a gift and we love your work on the telly, Dancing with the Stars, also very popular. I'm a huge reality TV girl, so I watch Oh, Hey, TV. look out for Lego Masters. It's coming <laughs> it's coming out shortly, um, I think sort of late April, early May. Sweet. Well, I'll make sure this goes up before then, but really, really grateful to you for coming on our little old website and sharing your story and just you know, also for sharing it more widely because it makes a difference. We are disruptors. We are slowly yes. chipping away at this culture of drinking, which has bedded itself in. It is going to move. It's going to be a big job. But every one of us that adds our little bit worth, it's like adding bricks and Lego. You see, there we go. <laughs> it's like we're building the ultimate Lego creation. Thank you very much. Thanks. See you. See you.